Chapter Eleven of Planet of the Damned by Harry Harrison. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven. Facing the silent Dissons, Brian's thoughts hurtled about in sweeping circles. There would be no more than an instant tick of time before the Magter avenged themselves bloodily and completely. He felt a fleeting regret for not having brought his gun, then abandoned the thought. There was no time for regrets. What could he do now? The silent watchers hadn't attacked instantly, and Brian realized that they couldn't be positive yet that Lig Magter had been killed. Only Brian himself knew the deadliness of that blow. Their lack of knowledge might buy him a little more time. Lig Magti is unconscious, but he will revive quickly, Brian said, pointing at the huddled body. As the eyes turned automatically to follow his finger, he began walking slowly towards the exit. I did not want to do this, but he forced me to, because he wouldn't listen to reason. Now I have something else to show you, something that I hoped it would not be necessary to reveal. He was saying the first words that came into his head, trying to keep them distracted as long as possible. He must appear to be only going across the room. That was the feeling he must generate. There was even time to stop for a second and straighten his rumpled clothing and brush the sweat from his eyes. Talking easily, walking slowly toward the hall that led out of the chamber. He was halfway there when the spell broke and the rush began. One of the Magter knelt and touched the body and shouted a single word. Dead! Brian hadn't waited for the official announcement. At the first movement of feet, he dived headlong for the shelter of the exit. There was a splatter of tiny missiles on the wall next to him, and he had a brief glimpse of raised blowguns before the wall intervened. He went up the dimly lit stairs three at a time. The pack was just behind him, voiceless and deadly. He could not gain on them. If anything, they were closing the distance as he pushed his already tired body to the utmost. There was no subtlety or trick he could use now. Just straightforward flight back the way he had come. A single slip on the irregular steps, and it would be all over. There was someone ahead of him. If the woman had waited a few seconds more, he would certainly have been killed, but instead of slashing at him as he went by the doorway, she made the mistake of rushing to the center of the stairs, the knife ready to impale him as he came up. Without slowing, Brian fell onto his hands and easily dodged under the blow. As he passed, he twisted and seized her around the waist, picking her from the ground. With her legs lifted from under her, the woman screamed, the first human sound Brian had heard in this human anthill. His pursuers were just behind him, and he hurled the woman into them with all his strength. They fell in a tangle and Brian used the precious seconds gained to reach the top of the building. There must have been other stairs and exits, because one of the Magters stood between Brian and the way down out of this trap, armed and ready to kill him if he tried to pass. As he ran towards the executioner, Brian flicked on his collar radio and shouted into it, I'm in trouble here. Can you... The guards in the car must have been waiting for this message. Before he had finished, there was the thud of a high-velocity slug hitting flesh, and the Disson spun and fell, blood soaking his shoulder. Brian leaped over him and headed for the ramp. The next one is me. Hold your fire, he called. Both guards must have had their telescopic sights zeroed on the spot. They let Brian pass, then threw in a hail of semi-automatic fire, that tore chunks from the stone and screamed away in noisy ricochets. Brian didn't try to see if anyone was braving this hail of covering fire. He concentrated his energies on making as quick and erratic a descent as he could. Above the sounds of the firing, he heard the car motor howl as it leaped forward. With their careful aim spoiled, the gunners switched to full automatic and unleashed a hailstorm of flying metal that bracketed the top of the tower. 
Cease firing! <sighs> Brian gasped into the radio as he ran. The driver was good and timed his arrival with exactitude. The car reached the base of the tower at the same instant Brian did, and he burst through the door while it was still moving. No orders were necessary. He fell headlong onto a seat as the car swung in a dust-raising turn and ground into high gear back to the city. Reaching over carefully, the tall guard gently extracted a bit of pointed wood and fluff from a fold of Brian's pants. He cracked open the car door and, just as delicately, threw it out. "'I knew that thing didn't touch you,' he said, "'since you are still among the living. They've got a poison on those blowgun darts that takes all of twelve seconds to work. Lucky.' "'Lucky?' Brian was beginning to realize just how lucky he was to be out of the trap alive. And with information. Now that he knew more about the Magter, he shuddered at his innocence in walking alone and unarmed into the tower. Skill had helped him survive, but better than average luck had been necessary. Curiosity had gotten him in, brashness and speed had taken him out. He was exhausted, battered, and bloody, but cheerfully happy. The facts about the Magter were arranging themselves into a theory that might explain their attempt at racial suicide. It just needed a little time to be put into shape. A pain cut across his arm, and he jumped, startled, pieces of his thoughts crashing into ruin around him. The gunner had cracked the first aid box and was swabbing his arm with antiseptic. The knife wound was long, but not deep. Brian shivered while the bandage was going on, then quickly slipped into his coat. The air conditioner whined industriously, bringing down the temperature. There was no attempt to follow the car. When the black tower had dropped over the horizon, the guards relaxed, ran cleaning rods through their guns, and compared marksmanship. All of their antagonism towards Brian was gone. They actually smiled at him. He had given them the first chance to shoot back since they had been on this planet. The ride was uneventful, and Brian was scarcely aware of it. A theory was taking form in his mind. It was radical and startling, yet it seemed to be the only one that fitted the facts. He pushed at it from all sides, but if there were any holes, he couldn't find them. What it needed was dispassionate proving or disproving. There was only one person on Dis who was qualified to do this. Leah was working in the lab when he came in, bent over a low-powered binocular microscope. Something small, limbless, and throbbing was on the slide. She glanced up when she heard his footsteps, smiling warmly when she recognized him. Fatigue and pain had drawn her face. Her skin, glistening with burn ointment, was chapped and peeling. "'I must look a wreck,' she said, putting the back of her hand to her cheek. "'Something like a well-oiled and slightly cooked piece of beef.' She lowered her arm suddenly and took his hand in both of hers. Her palms were warm and slightly moist. "'Thank you, Brian,' was all she could say. Her society on Earth was highly civilized and sophisticated, able to discuss any topic without emotion and without embarrassment. This was fine in most circumstances, but it made it difficult to thank a person for saving your life. However you tried to phrase it, it came out sounding like a last-act speech from a historical play. There was no doubt, however, as to what she meant. Her eyes were large and dark the pupils dilated by the drugs she had been given. They could not lie, nor could the emotions he sensed. He did not answer, just held her hand an instant longer. "'How do you feel?' he asked, concerned. His conscience twinged as he remembered that he was the one who had ordered her out of the bed and back to work today. "'I should be feeling terrible,' she said with an airy wave of her hand, but I'm walking on top of the world. 
I'm so loaded with painkillers and stimulants that I'm high as the moon. All the nerves to my feet feel turned off. It's like walking on two balls of fluff. Thanks for getting me out of that awful hospital and back to work. Brian was suddenly sorry for having driven her from her sickbed. Don't be sorry, Leah said, apparently reading his mind, but really seeing only his sudden ashamed expression. I'm feeling no pain, honestly. I feel a little lightheaded and foggy at times, nothing more. And this is the job I came here to do. In fact, well, it's almost impossible to tell you just how fascinating it all is. It was almost worth getting baked and parboiled for. She swung back to the microscope, centering the specimen with a turn of the stage adjustment screw. Poor Igel was right when he said this planet was exobiologically fascinating. This is a gastropod, a lot like Ostodomia, but it has parasitical morphological changes so profound that there's something else I remember, Brian said, interrupting her enthusiastic lecture, only half of which he could understand. Didn't I, Jill, also hope that you would give some study to the natives as well as their environment? The problem is with the Dissons, not with the local wildlife. But I am studying them, Leah insisted. The Dissons have attained an incredibly advanced form of commensalism. Their lives are so intimately connected and integrated with the other life forms that they must be studied in relation to their environment. I doubt if they show as many external physical changes as little eating foot autostomia on the slide here, but there will surely be a number of psychological changes and adjustments to that will crop up. One of these might be the explanation of their urge for planetary suicide. That may be true, but I don't think so, Brian said. I went on a little expedition this morning and found something that has more immediate relevancy. For the first time, Leah became aware of his slightly battered condition. Her drug-grooved mind could only follow a single idea at a time and had overlooked the significance of the bandage and dirt. I've been visiting, Brian said, forestalling the question on her lips. The Magter are the ones who are responsible for causing the trouble, and I had to see them up close before I could make any decisions. It wasn't a very pleasant thing, but I found out what I wanted to know. They are different in every way from the normal Dissons. I've compared them. I've talked to Ulv, the native who saved us in the desert, and I can understand him. He is not like us in many ways. He certainly couldn't be living in this oven. But he is still undeniably human. He gave us drinking water when we needed it, then brought help. The Magter, the upper-class lords of Dis, are the direct opposite. As cold-blooded and ruthless a bunch of murderers as you can possibly imagine. They tried to kill me when they met me without reason. Their clothes, habits, dwellings, manners, everything about them differs from that of the normal Dissin. More importantly, the Magter are as coldly efficient and inhuman as a reptile. They have no emotions, no love, no hate, no anger, no fear, nothing. Each of them is a chilling bundle of thought processes and reactions with all the emotions removed. Aren't you exaggerating? Leah asked. After all, you can't be sure. It might just be part of their training not to reveal any emotional state. Everyone must experience emotional states whether they like it or not. That's my main point. Everyone does, except the Magter. I can't go into all the details now, so you'll just have to take my word for it. Even at the point of death, they have no fear or hatred. It may sound impossible, but it is true. Leah tried to shake the knots from her drug-hazed mind. I'm dull today, she said. You'll have to excuse me. If these rulers had no emotional responses, that might explain their present suicidal position. But an explanation like this raises more new problems than it supplies answers to the old ones. 
How did they get this way? It doesn't seem humanly possible to be without emotions of some kind. Just my point. Not humanly possible. I think these ruling class Dissons aren't human at all, like the other Dissons. I think they are alien creatures, robots or androids, anything except men. I think they are living in disguise among the normal human dwellers. At first, Leah started to smile. Then her feelings changed when she saw his face. You are serious? she asked. Never more so. I realize it must sound as if I've had my brains bounced around too much this morning. Yet this is the only idea I can come up with that fits all of the facts. Look at the evidence yourself. One simple thing stands out clearly and must be considered first if any theory is to hold up. That is, the Magter's complete indifference to death, their own or anyone else's. Is that normal to mankind? No, but I can find a couple of explanations that I would rather explore first before dragging in an alien life form. There may have been a mutation or an inherited disease that has deformed or warped their minds. Wouldn't that be sort of self-eliminating? Brian asked. Anti-survival? People who die before puberty would find it a little difficult to pass on a mutation to their children. But let's not beat this one point to death. It's the totality of these people that I find so hard to accept. Any one thing might be explained away but not the collection of them. What about their complete lack of emotion, or their manner of dress, and their secrecy in general? The ordinary Disson wears a cloth kilt, while the mag to cover themselves as completely as possible. They stay in their black towers and never go out except in groups. Their dead are always removed so they can't be examined. In every way they act like a race apart. And I think they are. Granted for the moment that this outlandish idea might be true, how did they get here? And why doesn't anyone know about it besides them? Easily enough explained, Brian insisted. There are no written records on this planet. After the breakdown, when the handful of survivors were just trying to exist here, the aliens could have landed and moved in. Any interference could have been wiped out. Once the population began to grow, the invaders found they could keep control by staying separate so their alien difference wouldn't be noticed. Why should that bother them? Leah asked. If they are so indifferent to death, they can't have any strong thoughts on public opinion or alien body odor. Why would they bother with such a complex camouflage? And if they arrived from another planet... What has happened to the scientific ability that brought them here? Peace, Brian said. I don't know enough to be able even to guess at answers to half your questions. I'm just trying to fit a theory to the facts. And the facts are clear. The Magter are so inhuman they would give me nightmares if I were sleeping these days. What we need is more evidence. Then get it, Leah said with finality. I'm not telling you to turn murderer, but you might try a bit of grave digging. Give me a scalpel and one of your friends stretched out on a slab, and I'll quickly tell you what he is or is not. She turned back to the microscope and bent over the eyepiece. That was really the only way to hack the Guardian knot. Dis had only thirty-six more hours to live, so individual deaths shouldn't be of any concern. He had to find a dead Magter, and if none was obtainable in the proper condition, he had to get one of them by violence. For a planetary savior, he was personally doing in an awful lot of the citizenry. He stood behind Leah, looking down at her thoughtfully while she worked. The back of her neck, lightly covered with gently curling hair, was turned toward him. With one of the about-face shifts the mind is capable of, his thoughts flipped from death to life, and he experienced a strong desire to caress this spot lightly, to feel the yielding texture of female flesh. 
Plunging his hands deep into his pockets, he walked quickly to the door. "'Get some rest soon,' he called to her. "'I doubt if those bugs will give you the answer. I'm going now to see if I can get the full-size specimen you want. "'The truth could be anywhere. I'll stay on these until you come back,' she said, not looking up from the microscope. Up under the roof was a well-equipped communications room. Brian had taken a quick look at it when he had first toured the building. The duty operator had earphones on, though only one of the phones covered an ear, and was monitoring through the bands. His shoeless feet were on the edge of the table, and he was eating a thick sandwich held in his free hand. His eyes bulged when he saw Brian in the doorway, and he jumped into a flurry of action. "'Hold the pose,' Brian told him. "'It doesn't bother me. "'And if you make any sudden moves, "'you are liable to break a phone, "'electrocute yourself, or choke to death. "'Just see if you can set the transceiver "'on this frequency for me.' "'Brian wrote the number on a scratch pad "'and slid it over to the operator. "'It was the frequency Professor Commander Kraft "'had given him for the radio of the illegal terrorists, "'the Nijord Army.' The operator plugged in a handset and gave it to Brian. Circuit open, he mumbled around a mouthful of still unswallowed sandwich. This is Brand, director of the CRF. Come in, please. He went on repeating this for more than ten minutes before he got an answer. What do you want? I have a message of vital urgency for you, and I would also like your help. Do you want any more information on the radio? No, wait there. We'll get in touch with you after dark. The carrier waved, went dead. Thirty-five hours to the end of the world, and all he could do was wait. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of Planet of the Damned by Harry Harrison. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Twelve On Brian's desk when he came in were two neat piles of paper. As he sat down and reached for them, he was conscious of an arctic coldness in the air, a frigid blast. It was coming from the air conditioner grill, which was now covered by welded steel bars. The control unit was sealed shut. Someone was either being very funny or very efficient. Either way, it was cold. Brian kicked at the cover plate until it buckled, then bent it aside. After a careful look into the interior, he disconnected one wire and shorted it to another. He was rewarded by a number of sputtering cracks and a quantity of smoke. The compressor moaned and expired. Fossil was standing in the door with more papers, a shocked expression on his face. "'What do you have there?' Brian asked. Fossil managed to straighten out his face and brought the folders to the desk, arranging them on the piles already there. "'These are the progress reports you asked for from all units.' Details to date, conclusions, suggestions, etc. And the other pile, Brian pointed. Off-planet correspondence, commissary invoices, requisitions. He straightened the edges of the stack while he answered. Daily reports, hospital log. His voice died away and stopped as Brian carefully pushed the stack off the edge of the desk into the wastebasket. In other words, red tape, Brian said. Well, it's all filed. One by one, the progress reports followed the first stack into the basket until the desk was clear. Nothing. It was just what he had expected. But there had always been the off chance that one of the specialists could come up with a new approach. They hadn't. They were all too busy specializing. Outside, the sky was darkening. The front entrance guard had been told to let in anyone who came asking for the director. There was nothing else Brian could do until the Nijard rebels made contact. Irritation bit at him. At least Leah was doing something constructive. He could look in on her. He opened the door to the lab with a feeling of pleasant anticipation. 
It froze and shattered instantly. Her microscope was hooded, and she was gone. She's having dinner, he thought, or... She's in the hospital. The hospital was on the floor below, and he went there first. Of course she's here, Dr. Stein grumbled. Where else should a girl in her condition be? She was out of bed long enough today. Tomorrow's the last day, and if you want to get any more work out of her before the deadline, you had better let her rest tonight. Better let the whole staff rest. I've been handing out tranquilizers like aspirin all day. They're falling apart. The world's falling apart. How is Leah doing? Considering her shape, she's fine. Go in and see for yourself if you won't take my word for it. I have other patients to look at. Are you that worried, doctor? Of course I am. I'm just as prone to the weakness of the flesh as the rest of you. We're sitting on a ticking bomb, and I don't like it. I'll do my job as long as it is necessary, but I'll also be damn glad to see the ship's land to pull us out. The only skin that I really feel emotionally concerned about right now is my own. And if you want to be let in on a public secret, the rest of your staff feels the same way. So don't look forward to too much efficiency. I never did, Brian said, retreating back. Leah's room was dark, illuminated only by the light of Dis's moon slanting in through the window. Brian let himself in and closed the door behind him. Walking quietly, he went over to the bed. Leah was sleeping soundly, her breathing gentle and regular. A night's sleep now would do as much good as all the medication. He should have gone then. Instead, he sat down in the chair placed next to the head of the bed. The guards knew where he was. He could wait here just as well as any place else. It was a stolen moment of peace on a world at the brink of destruction. He was grateful for it. Everything looked less harsh in the moonlight, and he rubbed some of the tension from his eyes. Leah's face was ironed smooth by the light, beautiful and young, a direct contrast to everything else on this poisonous world. Her hand was outside of the covers, and he took it in his own, obeying a sudden impulse. Looking out of the window at the desert in the distance, he let the peace wash over him, forcing himself to forget for the moment that in one more day life would be stripped from this planet. Later, when he looked back at Leah, he saw that her eyes were open, though she hadn't moved. How long had she been awake? He jerked his hand away from hers, feeling suddenly guilty. Is the boss man looking after the serfs? to see if they're fit for the treadmills in the morning?" she asked. It was the kind of remark she had used with such frequency in the ship, though it didn't sound quite as harsh now. And she was smiling. Yet it reminded him too well of her superior attitude toward rubes from the stellar sticks. Here he might be the director, but on ancient earth he would be only one more gaping, lead-footed yokel. How do you feel? he asked, realizing and hating the triteness of the words, even as he said them. Terrible. I'll be dead by morning. Reach me a piece of fruit from that bowl, will you? My mouth tastes like an old boot heel. I wonder how fresh food ever got here. Probably a gift to the working classes from the smiling planetary murderers on Nijord. She took the apple Brian gave her and bit into it. Did you ever think of going to Earth? Brian was startled. This was too close to his own thoughts about planetary backgrounds. There couldn't possibly be a connection, though. Never, he told her. Up until a few months ago, I never even considered leaving Anvar. The Twenties are such a big thing at home that it is hard to imagine that anything else exists while you are still taking part in them. Spare me the Twenties she pleaded. After listening to you and Igel, I know far more about them than I shall ever care to know. But what about Anvar itself? Do you have big city-states as Earth does? Nothing like that. For its size, it has a very small population, no big cities at all. 
I guess the largest centers of population are around the schools, packing plants, things like that. Any exobiologists there? Leah asked with a woman's eternal ability to make any general topic personal. At the universities, I suppose, though I wouldn't know for sure. And you must realize that when I say no big cities, I also mean no little cities. We aren't organized that way at all. I imagine the basic physical unit is the family and the circle of friends. Friends get important quickly, since the family breaks up when children are relatively young. Something in the genes, I suppose. We all enjoy being alone. I suppose you might call it an inbred survival trait. Up to a point, she said, biting delicately into the apple. Carry that sort of thing too far and you end up with no population at all. A certain amount of proximity is necessary for that. Of course it is. And there must be some form of recognized relationship or control that are complete promiscuity. On Anvar, the emphasis is on personal responsibility, and that seems to take care of the problem. If we didn't have an adult way of looking at it, things, our kind of life, would be impossible. Individuals are brought together, either by accident or design, and with this proximity must be some certainty of relations. You're losing me, Leah protested. Either I'm still foggy from the dope, or you are suddenly unable to speak a word of less than four syllables. You know, whenever this happens with you, I get the distinct impression that you are trying to cover up something. For Occam's sake, be specific. Bring me together two of those hypothetical individuals and tell me what happens. Brian took a deep breath. He was in over his head and far from sure. Well, uh, take a bachelor like myself. Since I like cross-country skiing, I made my home in this big house our family has, right at the edge of the broken hills. In summer I looked after a drum-tum herd, but after slaughtering, my time was my own all winter. I did a lot of skiing and used to work for the twenties. Sometimes I would go visiting. Then again, people would drop in on me. Houses are few and far between on Anvar. We don't even have locks on our doors. You accept and give hospitality without qualification. Whoever comes, male, female, and groups are just traveling alone. I get the drift. Life must be dull for a single girl on your iceberg planet. She must surely have to stay home a lot. Only if she wants to. Otherwise, she can go wherever she wishes and be welcomed as another individual. I suppose it is out of fashion in the rest of the galaxy and would probably raise a big laugh on Earth. But a platonic, disinterested friendship between man and woman is an accepted thing on Anvar. Sounds exceedingly dull. If you are all such cool and distant friends, how do babies get made? Brian felt his ears reddening, not sure if he was being teased or not. The same damn way they get made any place else. But it's not just a reflective process like a couple of rabbits that happen to meet under the same bush. It's the woman's choice to indicate if she is interested in marriage. Is marriage the only thing your women are interested in? Marriage or anything else. That's up to the girl. We have a special problem on Anvar. Probably the same thing occurs on every planet where the human race has made a massive adaptation. Not all unions are fertile, and there is always a large percentage of miscarriages. A large number of births are conceived by artificial insemination, which is all right when you can't have babies normally. But most women have an emotional bias towards having their husband's children, and there is only one way to find out if this is possible. Leah's eyes widened. Are you suggesting that your girls see if a man can father children before considering marriage? Of course. Otherwise, Anvar would have been depopulated centuries ago. Therefore, the woman does the choosing. If she is interested in a man, she says so. If she is not interested, the man would never think of suggesting anything. It's a lot different from other planets, but so is our planet Anvar. 
It works well for us, which is the only test that applies. Just about the opposite of Earth, Leah told him, dropping the apple core into a dish and carefully licking the tips of her fingers. I guess you Anvarians would describe Earth as a planetary hotbed of sexuality. The reverse of your system, and going full blast all the time. There are far too many people there for comfort. Birth control came late, and is still being fought, if you can possibly imagine that. There are just too many of the archaic religions still around, as well as crack-brained ideas that have been long entrenched in custom. The world's overcrowded. Men, women, children, a boiling mob wherever you look. And all of the physically mature ones seem to be involved in the great game of love. The male is always the aggressor, not physically, at least not often, and women take the most outrageous kinds of flattery for granted. At parties there are always a couple of hot breaths of passion fanning your neck. A girl has to keep her spike heels filed sharp. She has to what? A figure of speech, Brian, meaning you fight back all the time if you don't want to be washed under by the flood. Sounds rather... Brian weighed the word before he said it but could find none other suitable. Repellent. From your point of view, it would be. I'm afraid we get so used to it that we even take it for granted. Sociologically speaking, she stopped and looked at Brian straight back in almost rigid posture. Her eyes widened and her mouth opened in an unspoken O oh of sudden realization. I'm being a fool, she said. You weren't speaking generally at all. You had a very specific subject in mind, namely me. Please, Leah, you must understand. But I do, she laughed. All the time I thought you were being a frigid and hard-hearted lump of ice. You were really being very sweet. Just playing the game in good old Anvarian style, waiting for a sign from me. We'd still be playing by different rules if you hadn't had more sense than I, and finally realized that somewhere along the line we must have got our signals mixed. And I thought you were some kind of frosty off-world celibate. She let her hand go out, and her fingers rustled through his hair. Something she had been wanting to do for a long time. I had to, he said, trying to ignore the light touch of her fingers, because I thought so much of you. I couldn't have done anything to insult you, such as forcing my attentions on you, until I began to worry where the insult would lie, since I knew nothing about your planet's mores. Well, you know now, she said very softly. The men aggress. Now that I understand, I think I like your way better, but I'm still not sure of all the rules. Do I explain that, yes, Brian, I like you so very much? You are more man in one great big wide-shouldered lump than I have ever met before. It's not quite the time or the place to discuss marriage, but I would certainly like... His arms were around her, holding her to him. Her hands clasped his, and their lips sought each other's in the darkness. Gently, she whispered, I bruise easily. End of chapter 12《ハリー・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ハリソン・ Get one of the wheeled stretchers down here from the hospital. I'll want it waiting when I get back. Outside, the street was darker than he remembered. Brian frowned, and his hand moved toward his gun. Someone had put all the nearby lights out of commission. There was just enough illumination from the stars to enable him to make out the dark bulk of a sand car. Brian Brand, a voice spoke harshly from the car. Get in. The motor roared as soon as he had closed the door. 
Without lights, the sand car churned a path through the city and out into the desert. Though the speed picked up, the driver still drove in the dark, feeling his way with a light touch on the controls. The ground rose, and when they reached the top of a mesa, he killed the engine. Neither the driver nor Brian had spoken a word since they left. A switch snapped, and the instrument lights came on. In their dim glow, Brian could just make out the other man's hawk-like profile. When he moved, Brian saw that his figure was cruelly shortened. Either accident or a mutated gene had warped his spine, hunching him forward in eternally bent supplication. Warped bodies were rare. His was the first Brian had ever seen. He wondered what series of events had kept him from medical attention all his life. This might explain the bitterness and pain in the man's voice. Did the mighty brains on Nijard bother to tell you that they have chopped another day off the deadline? The man asked. That this world is about to come to an end? Yes, I know, Brian said. That's why I'm asking your group for help. Our time is running out too fast. The man didn't answer. He merely grunted and gave his full attention to the radar pings and glowing screen. The electronic senses reached out as he made a check on all the search frequencies to see if they were being followed. "'Where are we going?' Brian asked. "'Out into the desert.' The driver made a vague wave of his hand. "'Headquarters of the Army. Since the whole thing will be blown up in another day, I guess I can tell you it's the only camp we have. All the cars, men, and weapons are based there. And Highs. He's the man in charge.' Tomorrow it will be all gone, along with this cursed planet. What's your business with us? Shouldn't I be telling Heise that? Suit yourself. Satisfied with the instrument check, the driver kicked the car to life again and churned on across the desert. But we're a volunteer army, and we have no secrets from each other. Just from the fools at home who are going to kill this world. There was a bitterness in his words. That he made no attempt to conceal. They fought among themselves and put off a firm decision so long that now we are forced to commit murder. From what I had heard, I thought it was the other way around. They call your Nijard army terrorist. We are. Because we are an army and we're at war. The idealist at home only understood that when it was too late. If they had backed us in the beginning, we would have blown open every black castle on Dis, searched until we found those bombs. But that would have meant wanton destruction and death. They wouldn't consider that. Now they are going to kill everyone, destroy everything. He flicked on the panel lights just long enough to take a compass bearing, and Brian saw the tortured unhappiness in his twisted body. It's not over yet, Brian said. There is more than a day left, and I think I'm on to something that might stop the war without any bombs being dropped. You're in charge of the Cultural Relationships Free Bread and Blankets Foundation, aren't you? What good can your bunch do when the shooting starts? None. But maybe we can put off the shooting. If you're trying to insult me, don't bother. My irritation quotient is very high. The driver merely grunted at this, slowing down as they ran through a field of broken rock. "'What is it you want?' he asked. "'We want to make a detailed examination of one of the Magter. Alive or dead, it doesn't make any difference. You wouldn't happen to have one around. No, we fought them often enough, but always on their home grounds. They keep all their casualties, and a good number of ours. What good will it do you anyway?' dead one won't tell you where the bombs or the jump space projector is i don't see why i should explain that to you unless you are in charge you are highs aren't you the driver gave an angry sound and then was silent while he drove finally he asked what makes you think that call it a hunch you don't act very much like a sand car driver for one thing of course your army may be all generals and no privates but I doubt it. I also know that time has almost run out for all of us. 
This is a long ride, and it would be a complete waste of time if you just sat out in the desert and waited for me. By driving me yourself, you could make your mind up before we arrived. Could have a decision ready as to whether you are going to help me or not. Are you? Yes, I'm Heise. But you still haven't answered my question. What do you want the body for? We are going to cut it open and take a good long look. I don't think the Magter are human. They are something living among men and disguised as men, but still not human. Sacred aliens? Heise exploded the words in a mixture of surprise and disgust. Perhaps the examination will tell us that. You're either stupid or incompetent, Hi said bitterly. The heat of dis has cooked your brains in your head. I'll be no part of this kind of absurd plan. You must, Brian said, surprised at his own calmness. He could sense the other man's interest hidden behind his insulting manner. I don't even have to give you my reasons. In another day this world ends and you have no way to stop it. I just might have an idea that would work, and you can't afford to take any chances, not if you are really sincere. Either you are a murderer killing Dissons for pleasure, or you honestly want to stop the war. Which is it? You'll have your body all right. Heis grated, hurling the car viciously around a spire of rock. Not that it will accomplish anything, but I can find no fault with killing another Magter. We can fit your operation into our plans without any trouble. This is the last night, and I have sent every one of my teams out on raids. We're breaking into as many Magter Towers as possible before dawn. There is a slim chance that we might uncover something. It's really just shooting in the dark, but it's all we can do now. My own team is waiting, and you can ride along with us. The other is left earlier. We're going to hit a small tower on this side of the city. We raided it once before and captured a lot of small arms they had stored there. There's a good chance that they may have been stupid enough to store something there again. Sometimes the Magter seem to suffer from a complete lack of imagination. You have no idea just how right you are, Brian told him. The sand car slowed down now as they approached a slab-sided mesa that rose vertically from the desert. They crunched across broken rocks, leaving no tracks. A light blinked on the dashboard, and Heise stopped instantly and killed the engine. They climbed out, stretching and shivering in the cold desert night. It was dark, walking in the shadow of the cliff, and they had to feel their way along a path through the tumbled boulders. A sudden blaze of light made Brian wince and shield his eyes. Near him, on the ground, was the humming shape of a cancellation projector, sending out a fan-shaped curtain of vibration that absorbed all the light rays falling upon it. This incredible blackness made a light-proof wall for the recessed hollow at the foot of the cliff. In this shelter, under the overhang of rock, were three open sand cars. They were large and armor-plated, warlike in their scarred gray paint. Men sprawled, talked, and polished their weapons. Everything stopped when Hyes and Brian appeared. Load up, Hyes called out. We're going to attack now. Same plan I outlined earlier. Get Telt over here. In talking to his own men, some of the harshness was gone from his voice. The tall soldiers of Nijard moved in ready obeisance of their commander. They loomed over his bent figure, most of them twice as tall as he, but there was no hesitation in jumping when he commanded. They were the body of the Nijord striking force. He was the brains. A square-cut, compact man rolled up to Highs and saluted with a leisurely flick of his hand. He was weighted and slung about with packs and electronic instruments. His pockets bulged with small tools and spare parts. "'This is Telt,' Heis said to Brian. "'He'll take care of you. "'Telt's my personal technical squad. "'He goes along on all my operations with his meters "'to test the interiors of the Disson forts. "'So far he's found no trace of a jump-space generator, 
or excess radioactivity that might indicate a bomb. Since he's useless and you're useless, you both take care of each other. Use the car we came in. Telt's wide face split in a frog-like grin. His voice was hoarse and throaty. Wait, just wait. Some day these needles gonna flicker and all our troubles will be over. What you want me to do with this stranger? Supply him with a corpse, one of the Magter, High said. Take it wherever he wants and then report back here. High scowled at Telt. Some day your needles will flicker. Poor fool, this is the last day. He turned away and waved the men into their sand cars. He likes me, Telt said, attaching a final piece of equipment. You can tell because he calls me names like that. He's a great man, Hyes is, but they never found out until it was too late. Uh, hand me that meter, will you? Brian followed the technician out to the car and helped him load his equipment aboard. When the larger cars appeared out of the darkness, Telt swung around after them. They snaked forward in a single line through the rocks until they came to the desert of rolling sand dunes. Then they spread out in line abreast and rushed towards their goal. Telt hummed to himself hoarsely as he drove. He broke off suddenly and looked at Brian. What do you want the dead dis for? A theory, Brian answered sluggishly. He had been half napping in the chair taking the opportunity for some rest before the attack. I'm still looking for a way to avert the end. You and Hyes, Telt said with satisfaction, couple of idealists, trying to stop a war you didn't start. They never would listen to Hyes. He told them in the beginning exactly what would happen, and he was right. They always thought his ideas were crooked, like him, <laughs> growing up alone in the hill camp with his back too twisted and too old to be fixed when he finally did come out? Ideas twisted the same way. Made him an authority on war. Ha! War on Nigerd. That's like being an ice cube specialist in hell. But he knew all about it, though they never would let him use what he knew. Put Granddaddy Kraft in charge instead. But Heiss is in charge of an army now. All volunteers, too few of them, and too little money. Too little and too damn late to do any good. I'll tell you we did our best, but it could never be good enough. And for this, we get called butchers. There was a catch in Telt's voice now, an undercurrent of emotion he couldn't suppress. At home, they think we like to kill, think we're insane. They can't understand we're doing the only thing that has to be done. He broke off as he quickly locked on the brakes and killed the engine. The line of sand cars had come to a stop. Ahead, just visible over the dunes, was the summit of a dark tower. We'll walk from here, Telt said, standing and stretching. We can take our time because the other boys go in first, soften things up. Then you and I head for the sub-cellar for a radiation check and find you a handsome corpse. Walking at first, then crawling when the dunes no longer shielded them, they crept up on the Disson Keep. Dark figures moved ahead of them, stopping only when they reached the crumbling black walls. They didn't use the ascending ramp, but made their way up the sheer outside face of the ramparts. Line throwers! Telt whispered. Anchor themselves when the missiles hit. Have some kind of quick-setting goo. Then we go up the filament with a line-climbing motor. Highs invented them. Is that the way you and I are going in? Brian asked. No, we get out of the climbing. I told you we hit this rock once before. I know the layout inside. He was moving while he talked, carefully pacing the distance around the base of the tower. Should be right about here. High-pitched keening sliced the air, and the top of the Magta building burst into flames. Automatic weapons hammered above them. Something fell silently through the night and hit heavily on the ground near them. Attack started, Telt shouted. We have to get through now while all the creepies are fighting it out on top. He pulled a plate-shaped object from one of his bags and slapped it hard against the wall. 
It hung there. He twisted the back of it, pulled something, and waved Brian to the ground. Shaped charge should blow straight in, but you never can tell. The ground jumped under them, and the ringing thud was a giant fist punching through the wall. A cloud of dust and smoke rolled clear, and they could see the dark opening in the rock, a tunnel driven into the wall by the directional force of the explosion. Telt shone a light through the hole at the crumbled chamber inside. Nothing to worry about from anybody who was leaning against this wall. Let's get in and out of this black beehive before the ones upstairs come down to investigate. Shattered rock was thick on the floor, and they skidded and tumbled over it. Telt pointed the way with his light down a sharply angled ramp. Underground chambers in the rock, they always store their stuff down there. A smoking black sphere arced out of the tunnel's mouth, hitting at their feet. Telt just gaped, but even as it hit the floor, Brian was jumping forward. He caught it with the side of his foot, kicking it back into the dark opening of the tunnel. Telt hit the ground next to him as the orange flame of an explosion burst below. Bits of shrapnel rattled from the ceiling and walls behind them. "'Grenades!' Telt gasped. "'They've only used them once before. Can't have many. Gotta warn highs. He plugged a throat mic into the transmitter on his tack and spoke quickly into it. There was a stirring below, and Brian poured a rain of fire into the tunnel. "'They're catching it bad on top, too. We gotta pull out. Go first, and I'll cover you.' I came for my disson. I'm not leaving until I get one. You're crazy. You're dead if you stay. Telt was scrambling back towards the crumbled entrance as he talked. His back was turned when Brian fired. The magter had appeared silently as the shadow of death. They charged without a sound, running with expressionless faces into the bullets. Two died at once, curling and folding. The third one fell at Brian's feet. Shot, pierced, dying, but not yet dead. Leaving a crimson track, it hunched closer, lifting its knife to Brian. He didn't move. How many times must you murder a man? Or was it a man? His mind and body rebelled against the killing, and he was almost ready to accept death himself rather than kill again. Telt's bullets tore through the body, and it dropped with grim finality. "'There's your corpse. Now get it out of here!' Telt screeched. Between them they worked the sodden weight of the dead magter through the hole, their exposed backs crawling with the expectation of instant death. No further attack came as they ran from the tower, other than a grenade that exploded too far behind them to do any harm. One of the armored sand cars circled the keep, had lights blazing, keeping up a steady fire from its heavy weapons. The attackers climbed into it as they beat a retreat. Telt and Brian dragged the disson behind them, struggling through the loose sand toward the circling car. Telt glanced over his shoulder and broke into a shambling run. "'They're following us!' he gasped. "'The first time they ever chased us after a raid!' "'They must know we have the body,' Brian said. "'Leave it behind!' Telt choked. "'Too heavy to carry, anyway!' "'I'd rather leave you!' Brian said sharply. Let me have it. He pulled the corpse away from the unresisting Telt and heaved it across his own shoulders. Now use your gun to cover us. Telt threw a rain of slugs back towards the dark figures following them. The driver of the sand car must have seen the flare of their fire because the truck turned and started towards them. It braked in a choking cloud of dust and ready hands reached to pull them up. Brian pushed the body in ahead of him and scrambled after it. The truck engine throbbed, and they churned away into the blackness, away from the gutted tower. Y you know, that was more like kind of a joke when I said I'd leave the corpse behind, Telt told Brian. You didn't believe me, did you? Yes, Brian said, holding the dead weight of the magter against the truck's side. I thought you meant it. Ah, Telt protested. You're as bad as highs. You take things too seriously. Brian suddenly realized that he was wet with blood, his clothing sodden. 
His stomach rose at the thought, and he clutched the edge of the sand car. Killing like this was too personal. Talking abstractly about a body was one thing, but murdering a man, then lifting his dead flesh and feeling his blood warm upon you is an entirely different matter. But the Magter weren't human. He knew that. The thought was only mildly comforting. After they had reached the other waiting sand cars, the raiding party split up. Each one goes in a different direction, Telt said, so they can't trek us to the base. He clipped a piece of paper next to the compass and kicked the motor into life. We'll make a big U in the desert and end up in Hovestad. I got the course here. Then I'll dump you and your friends and beat it back to our camp. You're not still burned at me for what I said, are you? Are you? Brian didn't answer. He was staring fixedly out of the side window. What's doing? Telt asked. Brian pointed out at the rushing darkness. Over there, he said, pointing to the growing light on the horizon. Dawn, Telt said. Lot of rain on your planet? Didn't you ever see the sun come up before? Not on the last day of a world. Lock it up. Telt grumbled. You give me the crawls. I know they're going to be blasted, but at least I know I did everything I could to stop it. How do you think we are going to be feeling at home, on Nijard, from tomorrow on? Maybe we can still stop it, Brian said, shrugging off the feeling of gloom. Telt's only answer was a wordless sound of disgust. By the time they had cut a large loop in the desert, the sun was well up in the sky, the daily heat begun. Their course took them through a chain of low, flinty hills that cut their speed almost to zero. They ground ahead in low gear, while Telt sweated and cursed, struggling with the controls. Then they were on firm sand and picking up speed towards the city. As soon as Brian saw Hovestad clearly, he felt a clutch of fear. From somewhere in the city, a black plume of smoke was rising. It could have been one of the deserted buildings aflame, a minor blaze. Yet the closer they came, the greater his tension grew. Brian didn't dare put it into words himself. It was Telt who vocalized the thought. A fire or something coming from your area, somewhere close to your building. Within the city, they saw the first signs of destruction. Broken rubble on the streets, the smell of greasy smoke in their nostrils. More and more people appeared, going in the same direction they were. The normally deserted streets of Hovestad were now almost crowded. Dissons, obvious by their bare shoulders, mixed with the few off-worlders who still remained. Brian made sure the tarpaulin was well wrapped around the body before they pushed the sandcar slowly through the growing crowd. I don't like all this publicity, Telt complained, looking at the people. It's the last day, or I'd be turning back. They know our cars. We've raided them often enough. Turning a corner, he braked suddenly, mouth agape. Ahead was destruction. Black, broken rubble had been churned into desolation. It was still smoking, pink tongues of flame licking over the ruins. A fragment of wall fell with a rumbling crash. "'It's your building, the Foundation building,' Telt shouted. "'They've been here ahead of us. Must have used the radio to call a raid. They did a job, explosive of some kind.' Hope was dead. Dis was dead. In the ruin ahead, mixed and broken with other rubble, were the bodies of all the people who had trusted him. Leah, beautiful and cruelly dead Leah. Dr. Stein, his patients, Fossil, all of them. He had kept them on this planet, and now they were dead. Every one of them. Dead. Murderer. End of chapter 13「Fourteen of Planet of the Damned » by Harry Harrison. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. 
Chapter Fourteen. Life was ended. Brian's mind contained nothing but despair and the pain of irretrievable loss. If his brain had been completely the master of his body, he would have died there, for at that moment there was no will to live. Unaware of this, his heart continued to beat, and the regular motion of his lungs drew in the dreadful sweetness of the smoke-tainted air. With automatic directness, his body lived on. "'What you gonna do?' Telt asked, even his natural exuberation still by this. Brian only shook his head as the words penetrated. What could he do? What could possibly be done? Follow me. A voice said in guttural dissent through the opening of a rear window. The speaker was lost in the crowd before they could turn. Aware now, Brian saw a native move away from the edge of the crowd and turn to look in their direction. It was Ulv. Turn the car, that way. He punched Telt's arm and pointed. Do it slowly and don't draw any attention to us. For a moment there was hope which he kept himself from considering. The building was gone and the people in it all dead. That fact had to be faced. What's going on? Telt asked. Who was that talked in the window? A native, that one up ahead. He saved my life in the desert, and I think he is on our side. Even though he's a native Disson, he can understand facts that the Magder can't. He knows what will happen to this planet. Brian was talking to fill his brain with words, so he wouldn't begin to have hope. There was no hope possible. Ulv moved slowly and naturally through the streets, never looking back. They followed as far behind as they dared yet still keeping him in sight. Fewer people were about here among the deserted off-world storehouses. Ulv vanished into one of these, Light Metals Trust Limited, the sign read above the door. Telt slowed the car. Don't stop here, Brian said. Drive around the corner and pull up. Brian climbed out of the car with an ease he did not feel, no one was in sight now in either direction. Walking slowly back to the corner, he checked the street they had just left. Hot, silent, and empty. A sudden blackness appeared where the door of the warehouse had been, and the sudden flickering motion of a hand. Brian signaled Telt to start, and jumped into the already moving sand car. Into that open door, quickly, before anyone sees us. The car rumbled down a ramp into the dark interior, and the door slid shut behind them. Ulv, what is it? Where are you? Brian called, blinking in the murky interior. A gray form appeared beside him. I am here. Did you— There was no way to finish the sentence. I heard of the raid. The Magter called together all of us they could to help them carry explosive. I went along, I could not stop them, and there was no time to warn anyone in the building. Then they are all dead? Yes, Ulv nodded. All except one. I knew I could perhaps save one. I was not sure who, so I took the woman you were with in the desert. She is here now. She was hurt, but not badly, when I brought her out. Guilty relief flooded through Brian. He shouldn't exult, not with the death of everyone in the Foundation still fresh in his mind. But at that instant he was happy. Let me see her, he said to Ulv. He was seized by the sudden fear that there might be a mistake. Perhaps Ulv had saved a different woman. Ulv led the way across the empty loading bay. Brian followed closely fighting down the temptation to tell him to hurry. When he saw that Ulv was heading towards an office in the far wall, he could control himself no longer and ran on ahead. It was Leah, lying unconscious on a couch. Sweat beaded her face and she moaned and stirred without opening her eyes. I gave her Sovar, then wrapped her in cloth so no one would know, Ulv said. Telt was close behind them, 
looking in through the open door. Sovar is a drug they take from one of their plants, he said. We got a lot of experience with it. A little makes a good knockout drug, but it's deadly poison in large doses. I got the antidote in the car. Wait, and I'll get it. He went out. Brian sat next to Leah and wiped her face clean of dirt and perspiration. The dark shadows under her eyes were almost black now, and her elfin face seemed even thinner. But she was alive. That was the important thing. Some of the tension drained away from Brian, and he could think again. There was still the job to do. After this last experience, Leah should be in a hospital bed, but this was impossible. He would have to drag her to her feet and put her back to work. The answer might still be found. Each second ticked away another fraction of the planet's life. Good as new in a minute, Telt said, banging down the heavy med box. He watched intently as Olv left the room. I should know about this renegade. Might be useful as a spy or for information, though of course it's too late now to do anything, so the hell with it. He pulled a pistol-shaped hypodermic gun from the box and dialed a number on the side. Now if you'll roll her sleeve up, I'll bring her back to life. He pressed the bell-shaped sterilizing muzzle against her skin and pulled the trigger. The hypno-gun hummed briefly, ending its cycle with a loud click. "'Does it work fast?' Brian asked. "'A couple of minutes. Just let her be and she'll come to by herself.' Olv was in the doorway. "'Kill her!' he hissed. His blow-gun was in his hand, half raised to his mouth. "'He's been in the car. He's seen it!' Telt shouted and grabbed for his gun. Brian sprang between them, raising his hands. "'Stop it! No more killing!' he shouted in disson. Then he shook his fist at Telt. "'Fire that gun, and I'll stuff it down your throat. I'll handle this.' He turned to face Olv, who hadn't brought the blowgun any closer to his lips. This was a good sign. The disson was still uncertain. "'You have seen the body in the car, Olv. So you must have seen that it is that of a magter. I killed him myself because I would rather kill one or ten or even a hundred men than have everyone on this planet destroyed. I killed him in a fair fight, and now I am going to examine his body. There is something very strange and different about the magter. You know that yourself. If I can find out what it is, perhaps we can make them stop this war and not bomb Nijord. Olv was still angry, but he lowered the blowgun a little. "'I wish there were no off-worlders,' he said. "'I wish that none of you had ever come. Nothing was wrong until you started coming. The Magter were the strongest, and they killed, but they also helped. Now they want to fight a war with your weapons, and for this you are going to kill my world, and you want me to help you?' "'Not me. Yourself.' Brian said wearily. There's no going back. That's the one thing we can't do. Maybe Dis would have been better off without off-planet contact. Maybe not. In any case, you have to forget about that. You have contact now with the rest of the galaxy for better or for worse. You've got a problem to solve, and I'm here to help you solve it. Seconds ticked by as Ulv, unmoving, fought with questions that were novel to his life. Could killing stop death? Could he help his people by helping strangers to fight and kill them? His world had changed, and he didn't like it. He must make a giant effort to change with it. Abruptly, he pushed the blowgun into a thong at his waist, turned, and strode out. Too much for my nerves. Telt said, settling his gun back in the holster. You don't know how happy I'm gonna be when this whole damn thing is over. Even if the planet goes bang, I don't care. I'm finished. He walked out to the sand car, keeping a careful eye on the disson crouched against the wall. Brian turned back to Leah, whose eyes were open, staring at the ceiling. He went to her. Running, she said and her voice had a toneless emptiness that screamed louder than any emotion. They ran by the open door of my room, 
and i could see them when they killed dr stein just butchered him like an animal chopping him down then one came into the room and that's all i remember she turned her head slowly and looked at brian what happened why am i here they're dead he told her all of them after the raid the disans blew up the building you're the only one that survived that was Olve who came into your room the disan we met in the desert he brought you away and hid you here in the city when do we leave she asked in the same empty tones turning her face to the wall when do we get off this planet today is the last day the deadline is tonight Kraft will have a ship pick us up when we are ready but we still have our job to do i've got that body you're going to have to examine it we must find out about the magter nothing can be done now except leave her voice was a dull monotone there is only so much that a person can do and i've done it please have the ship come i want to leave now brian bit his lip in helpless frustration nothing seemed to penetrate the apathy into which she had sunk too much shock too much terror in too short a time he took her chin in his hand and turned her head to face him she didn't resist but her eyes were shining with tears tears trickled down her cheeks take me home brian please take me home he could only brush her sodden hair back from her face and force himself to smile at her the moments of time were running out faster and faster and he no longer knew what to do the examination had to be made yet he couldn't force her he looked for the med box and saw that telt had taken it back to the sand car there might be something in it that could help a tranquilizer perhaps Telt had some of his instruments open on the chart table and was examining a tape with a pocket magnifier when Brian entered. He jumped nervously and put the tape behind his back, then relaxed when he saw who it was. I thought you were the creepy out there, coming for a look, he whispered. Maybe you trust him, but I can't afford to. Can't even use a radio. I'm getting out of here now. I have to tell Highs. Tell him what? Brian asked sharply. What is all the mystery about? Telt handed him the magnifier and tape. Look at that. Recording tape from my scintillation counter. Red verticals are five-minute intervals. The wiggly black horizontal line is the radioactivity level. All this, where the line goes up and down, that's when we were driving out to the attack, varying hot level of the rock and ground. What's the big peak in the middle? that coincides exactly with our visit to the house of horrors when we went through the hole in the bottom of the tower he couldn't keep the excitement out of his voice does it mean that i don't know i'm not sure i have to compare it with other tapes back at base it could be the stone of the tower some of these heavy rock have a high natural count there maybe could be a box of instruments there with fluorescent dials or it might be one of those tactical atomic bombs they threw at us already. Some arms runners sold them a few. Or it could be the cobalt bombs? It could be, Telt said, packing his instruments swiftly. A badly shielded bomb, or an old one with a crack in the skin, could give a trace like that. Just a little radon leaking out would do it. Why don't you call Highs on the radio and let him know? I don't want Granddaddy Kraft's listening post to hear about it. This is our job, if I'm right, and I have to check my old tapes to make sure. But it's gonna be worth a raid. I can feel that in my bones. Let's unload your corpse. He helped Brian with the clumsy, wrapped bundle, then slipped into the driver's seat. Hold it, Brian said. Do you have anything in the med box I can use for Leah? She seems to have cracked. Not hysterical, but withdrawn. Won't listen to reason, won't do anything but lie there and ask to go home. Got the potion here, Telt said, cracking the med box. Slaughter syndrome is what our medics call it. Hit a lot of our boys. 
grow up all your life hating the idea of violence and it goes rough when you have to start killing people guys break up break down go to pieces lots of different ways the medic mixed up this stuff don't know how it works probably tranquilizers and some of the cortex drugs but it peels off recent memories maybe for the last ten twelve hours you can't get upset about what you don't remember he pulled out a sealed package directions on the box good luck luck brian said and shook the technician's calloused hand let me know if the traces are strong enough to be bombs he checked the street to make sure it was clear then pressed the door button the sand car churned out into the brilliant sunshine and was gone the throb of its motor dying in the distance brian closed the door and went back to leah Olve was still crouched against the wall there was a one-shot disposable hypodermic in the box leah made no protest when he broke the seal and pressed the needle against her arm she sighed and her eyes closed again when he saw she was resting easily he dragged in the tarpaulin wrapped body of the magter a workbench ran along one wall and he struggled the corpse up onto it he unwrapped a tarpaulin and the sightless eyes stared accusingly up into his using his knife brian cut away the loose blood-soaked clothing strapped under the clothes around the man's waist was the familiar collection of disson artifacts this could have significance either way human or humanoid the creature would still have to live on dis brian threw it aside along with the clothing nude pierced bloody the corpse lay before him in every external physical detail the man was human brian's theory was becoming more preposterous with each discovery if the magter weren't alien how could he explain their complete lack of emotions a mutation of some kind he didn't see how it was possible there had to be something alien about the dead man before him the future of a world rested on this flimsy hope if telt's lead to the bombs proved to be false there would be no hope left at all leah was still unconscious when he looked at her again there was no way of telling how long the coma would last he would probably have to waken her out of it but he didn't want to do it too early it took an effort to control his impatience even though he knew the drug needed time in which to work he finally decided on at least a minimum of an hour before he should try to disturb her that would be noon twelve hours before destruction one thing he should do was to get in touch with professor commander craft maybe it was being defeatist but he had to make sure that they had a way off this planet if the mission failed Kraft had installed a relay radio that would forward calls from his personal set if this relay had been in the foundation building contact was broken this had to be found out before it was too late brian thumbed on his radio and sent the call the reply came back instantly this is fleet communications will you please keep this circuit open commander Kraft is waiting for this call and it is being put directly through to him now Kraft's voice broke in while the operator was still talking who is making this call is it anyone from the foundation the old man's voice was shaky with emotion brand here i have leah maurice with me no more are there no other survivors from the disaster that destroyed your building that's it other than us it's a complete loss with the building and all the instruments gone i have no way to contact our ship in orbit can you arrange to get us out of here if necessary give me your location a ship is coming now i don't need a ship now brian interrupted don't send it until i call if there is a way to stop your destruction i'll find it so i'm staying to the last minute if necessary craft was silent there was only the crackle of an open mic and the sound of breathing that is your decision he said finally i have a ship standing by but won't you let us take miss maurice out now no i need her here we are still working looking for what answer could you find that could possibly avert destruction now 
His tone was between hope and despair. Brian couldn't help him. If I succeed, you'll know. Otherwise, that will be the end of it. End of transmission. He switched the radio off. Leah was sleeping easily when he looked at her, and there was still a good part of the hour left before he could wake her. How could he put it to use? She would need tools, instruments to examine the corpse, and there were certainly none here. Perhaps he could find some in the ruins of the foundation building. With this thought, he had the sudden desire to see the wreckage up close. There might be other survivors. He had to find out. If he could talk to the men he had seen working there... Olv was crouched against the wall in the outer room. He looked up angrily when Brian came over, but said nothing. "'Will you help me again?' Brian asked. "'Stay and watch the girl while I go out. I'll be back at noon.' Olv didn't answer. "'I am still looking for the way to save Dis,' Brian added. "'Go. I'll watch the girl.' Olv spat words in impotent fury. I do not know what to do. You may be right. Go. She will be safe with me. Brian slipped out into the deserted street, and, half running, half walking, made his way toward the rubble that had been the Cultural Relationships Foundation. He used a different course from the one they had come by, striking first toward the outer edge of the city. Once there, he could swing and approach from the other side, so there would be no indication where he had come from. The Magter might be watching, and he didn't want to lead them to Leah and the stolen body. Turning a corner, he saw a sand car stopped in the street ahead. There was something familiar about the lines of it. It could be the one he and Telt had used, but he wasn't sure. He looked around, but the dusty, packed dirt street was white and empty shimmering in silence under the sun staying close to the wall and watching carefully brian slipped towards the car when he came close behind it he was positive it was the one he had been in the night before what was it doing here silence and heat filled the street windows and doors were empty and there was no motion in their shadows putting his foot on a bogey wheel he reached up and grabbed the searing metal rim of the open window. He pulled himself up and stared at Telt's smiling face. Smiling in death. The lips pulled back to reveal the grinning teeth, the eyes bursting from the head, the features swollen and contorted from the deadly poison. A tiny tuft dart of wood stuck in the brown flesh on the side of his neck. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of Planet of the Damned by Harry Harrison This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 15 Brian hurled himself backward and sprawled flat in the dust and filth of the road. No poison dart sought him out. The empty silence still reigned. Telt's murderers had come and gone. Moving quickly, using the bulk of the car as a shield, he opened the door and slipped inside. They had done a thorough job of destruction. All of the controls had been battered into uselessness. The floor was a junk heap of crushed equipment, intertwined with loops of recording tape bulging like mechanical intestines. A gutted machine destroyed like its driver. It was easy enough to reconstruct what had happened. The car had been seen when they entered the city, probably by some of the Magter who had destroyed the foundation building. They had not seen where it had gone, or Brian would surely be dead by now. But they must have spotted it when Telt tried to leave the city and stopped it in the most effective way possible. A dart through the open window into the unsuspecting driver's neck. Telt, dead. The brutal impact of the man's death had driven all thought of its consequences from Brian's mind. Now he began to realize. Telt had never sent word of his discovery of the radioactive trace to the Nijord army. 
he had been afraid to use the radio and had wanted to tell heiss in person and to show him the tape only now the tape was torn and mixed with all the others the brain that could have analyzed it dead brian looked at the dangling entrails of the radio and spun for the door running swiftly and erratically he fled from the sand car his own survival and the possible survival of dis depended on his not being seen near it he must contact heiss and pass on the information until he did that he was the only off-worlder on dis who knew which magter tower might contain the world-destroying bombs once out of sight of the sand car he went more slowly wiping the sweat from his streaming face he hadn't been seen leaving the car, and he wasn't being followed. The streets here weren't familiar, but he checked his direction by the sun and walked at a steady, fast pace toward the destroyed building. More of the native Dissons were in the streets now. They all noticed him. Some even stopped and scowled fiercely at him. With his empathic awareness, he felt their anger and hatred. A knot of men radiated death and he put his hand on his gun as he passed them two of them had their blow guns ready but didn't use them by the time he had turned the next corner he was soaked with nervous perspiration ahead was the rubble of the destroyed building grounded next grounded next to it was the tapered form of a spacer's pinnacle two men had come from the open lock and were standing at the edge of the burnt area Brian's boots grated loudly on the broken wreckage. The men turned quickly towards him, guns raised. Both of them carried ion rifles. They relaxed when they saw his off-world clothes. "'Bloody damn savages!' one of them growled. He was a heavy planet man, a squashed-down column of muscle and gristle, whose head barely reached Brian's chest. A pushed-back cap had the crossed slide rule symbol of ship's computer man can't blame them i guess the second man said he wore purser's insignia his features were different but with the same compacted body the two men were as physically alike as twins probably from the same home planet they're gonna get their whole world blown out from under them at midnight looks as if the poor slob in the streets finally realized what is happening hope we're in jump space by then I saw Estrada's world get it, and I don't want to see that again, not twice in one lifetime. The computer man was looking closely at Brian, head tilted sideways to see his face. You need transportation off-world? he asked. We're the last ship at the port, and we're going to borrow out of here as soon as the rest of our cargo is aboard. We'll give you a lift if you need it. Only by tremendous effort at control did Brian conceal the destroying sorrow that overwhelmed him when he looked at that shattered wasteland, the graveyard of so many. No, he said, that won't be necessary. I'm in touch with the blockading fleet and they'll pick me up before midnight. You from Nijard? the purser growled. No, Brian said, still only half aware of the men. But there is trouble with my own ship. He realized that they were looking intently at him, and he owed them some kind of explanation. I thought I could find a way to stop the war. Now, I'm not so sure. He hadn't intended to be so frank with the spaceman, but the words had been uppermost in his thoughts and had simply slipped out. The computer man started to say something, but his shipmate speared him in the side with his elbow. We blast soon, and I don't like the way these Dissons are looking at us. The captain said to find out what caused the fire, then get the hell back. So let's go. Don't miss your ship, the computer man said to Brian, and he started for the pinnacle. Then he hesitated and turned. Sure there's nothing we can do for you? Sorrel would accomplish nothing. Brian fought to sweep the dregs of emotion from his mind and to think clearly. You can help me, he said. I could use a scalpel or any other surgical instrument you might have. Leah would need those. Then he remembered Telt's undelivered message. Do you have a portable radio transceiver? I can pay you for it. The computer man vanished inside the rocket and reappeared a minute later with a small package. 
There's a scalpel and a magnetized tweezer in there. All I could find in the med kit. Hope they'll do. He reached inside and swung out the metal case of a self-contained transceiver. Take this. It's got plenty of range, even on the longer frequencies. He raised his hand at Brian's offer to pay. My donation, he said. If you can save this planet, I'll give you the whole pinnacle as well. We'll tell the captain we lost the radio in some trouble with the natives. Isn't that right, moneybags? He prodded the purser in the chest with a finger that would have punched a hole through a weaker man. I read you loud and clear, the purser said. I'll make out an invoice so stating back in the ship. They were both in the pinnacle then, and Brian had to move fast to get clear of the takeoff blast. A sense of obligation. The spaceman had felt it, too. The realization of this raised Brian's spirits a bit as he searched through the rubble for anything useful. He recognized part of a wall still standing as a corner of the laboratory. Poking through the ruins, he unearthed broken instruments and a single battered case that had barely missed destruction. Inside was the binocular microscope, the right tube bent, its lenses cracked and obscured. The left eyepiece still seemed to be functioning. Brian carefully put it back in the case. He looked at his watch. It was almost noon. These few pieces of equipment would have to do for the dissection. Watched suspiciously by the onlooking Dissons, he started back to the warehouse. It was a long, circuitous walk, since he didn't dare give any clues to his destination. Only when he was positive he had not been observed or followed did he slip through the building's entrance, locking the door behind him. Leah's frightened eyes met his when he went into the office. "'A friendly smile here among the cannibals,' she called. Her strained expression gave the lie to the cheeriness of her words. "'What has happened? Since I woke up, the great stone face over there,' she pointed to Ulv, "'has been telling me exactly nothing.' "'What's the last thing you can remember?' Brian asked carefully. He didn't want to tell her too much, lest this bring on the shock again. Ulv had shown great presence of mind in not talking to her. "'If you must know,' Leah said, "'I remember quite a lot, Brian Brand. I shan't go into details, since this sort of thing is best kept from the natives. For the record, then, I can recall going to sleep after you left, and nothing since then. It's weird.' I went to sleep in that lumpy hospital bed and woke up on this couch, feeling simply terrible, with him just sitting there and scowling at me. Won't you please tell me what is going on? A partial truth was best, saving all of the details that he could for later. The Magter attacked the Foundation building, he said. They are getting angry at all the off-worlders now. You were still knocked out by a sleeping drug, so Ulv helped bring you here. It's afternoon now. Of the last day? She sounded horrified. While I'm playing Sleeping Beauty, the world is coming to an end? Was anyone hurt in the attack or killed? There were a number of casualties and plenty of trouble, Brian said. He had to get her off the subject. Walking over to the corpse, he threw back the cover from its face. But this is more important right now. It's one of the Magter. I have a scalpel and some other things here. Will you perform an autopsy? Leah huddled back on the couch, her arms around herself, looking chilled in spite of the heat of the day. What happened to the people at the building? she asked in a thin voice. The injection had removed her memories of the tragedy, but echoes of the strain and shock still reverberated in her mind and body. I feel so uh, exhausted. Please tell me what happened. I have the feeling you're hiding something. Brian sat next to her and took her hands in his, not surprised to find them cold. Looking into her eyes, he tried to give her some of his strength. It wasn't very nice, he said. You were shaken up by it. I imagine that's why you feel the way you do now. But, Leah, you'll have to take my word for this. Don't ask any more questions. There's nothing we can do about it now, but we can still find out about the Magter. Will you examine the corpse? 
She started to ask something, then changed her mind. When she dropped her eyes, Brian felt the thin shiver that went through her body. There's something terribly wrong, she said. I know that. I guess I'll have to take your word that it's best not to ask questions. Help me up, will you, darling? My legs are absolutely liquid. Leaning on him, with his arm around her, supporting most of her weight, she went slowly across to the corpse. She looked down and shuddered. Not what you would call a natural death, she said. Ulv watched intently as she took the scalpel out of its holder. You don't have to look at this, she told him in halting disson. Not if you don't want to. I want to, he told her, not taking his eyes from the body. I have never seen a Magter dead before, or without covering like an ordinary person. He continued to stare fixedly. Find me some drinking water, will you, Brian? Leah said. And spread the tarp under the body. These things are quite messy. After drinking the water, she seemed stronger and could stand without holding on to the table with both hands. Placing the tip of the scalpel just below the magter's breastbone, she made the long post-mortem incision down to the pubic symphysis. The great body-length wound gaped open like a red mouth. Across the table, Ulv shuddered, but didn't avert his eyes. One by one she removed the internal organs. Once she looked up at Brian, then quickly returned to work. The silence stretched on and on until Brian had to break it. Tell me, can't you? Have you found out anything? His words snapped the thin strand of her strength, and she staggered back to the couch and collapsed onto it. Her blood-stained hands hung over the side, making a terribly strange contrast to the whiteness of her skin. "'I'm sorry, Brian,' she said. "'But there's nothing, nothing at all. There are minor differences, organic changes I've never seen before. His liver is tremendous, for one thing. But changes like this are certainly consistent with the patterns of Homo sapiens, as adapted to a different planet.' He's a man, changed, adapted, modified, but still just as human as you or I. How can you be sure? Brian broke in. You haven't examined him completely, have you? She shook her head. Then go on, the other organs, his brain, a microscopic examination. Here, he said, pushing the microscope case towards her with both hands. She dropped her head onto her forearms and sobbed. Oh, leave me alone, can't you? I'm tired and sick and fed up with this awful planet. Let them die. I don't care. Your theory is false, useless. <sighs> Admit that, and let me wash the filth from my hands. <laughs> Sobbing drowned out her words. Brian stood over her and drew a shuddering breath. Was he wrong? He didn't dare think about that. He had to go on. Looking down at the thinness of her bent back, with the tiny projections of her spine showing through the thin cloth, he felt an immense pity, a pity he couldn't surrender to. This thin, helpless, frightened woman was his only resource. She had to work. He had to make her work. Igel had done it used projective empathy to impress his emotions upon Brian. Now Brian must do it with Leah. He had had some sessions of the art, but not nearly enough to make him proficient. Nevertheless, he had to try. Strength was what Leah needed. Aloud, he said simply, You can do it. You have the will and the strength to finish and silently his mind cried out the order to obey, to share his power now that hers was drained and finished. Only when she lifted her face and he saw the dried tears did he realize that he had succeeded. "'You will go on?' he asked quietly. Leah merely nodded and rose to her feet. She shuffled like a sleepwalker jerked along by invisible strings. Her strength wasn't her own. 
and the situation reminded him unhappily of that last event of the twenties when he had experienced the same kind of draining activity she wiped her hands roughly on her clothes and opened the microscope case the slides are all broken she said this will do brian told her crashing his heel through the glass partition shorts tinkled and crashed to the floor he took some of the bigger pieces and broke them to rough squares that would fit under the clips of the stage leah accepted them without a word putting a drop of the magter's blood on the slide she bent over the eyepiece her hands shook when she tried to adjust the focusing using low power she examined the specimen squinting through the angled tube once she turned the substage mirror a bit to catch the light streaming in the window brian stood behind her fists clenched forcibly controlling his anxiety what do you see he finally blurted out phagocytes platelets leukocytes everything seems normal her voice was dull exhausted her eyes blinking with fatigue as she stared into the tube anger at defeat burned through brian even faced with failure he refused to accept it he reached over her shoulder and savagely twisted the turret of the microscope until the longest lens was in position if you can't see anything try the high power it's there i know it's there i'll get you a tissue sample he turned back to the disemboweled cadaver his back was turned and he did not see that sudden stiffening of her shoulders or the sudden eagerness that seized her fingers as they adjusted the focus but he did feel the wave of emotion that welled from her impinging directly on his empathetic sense what is it he called to her as if she had spoken aloud something something here she said in this leukocyte it's not normal structure but it's familiar i've seen something like it before but i just can't remember she turned away from the microscope and unthinkingly pressed her gory knuckles to her forehead i know i've seen it before brian squinted into the deserted microscope and made out a dim shape in the center of the field it stood out sharply when he focused the white jellyfish shape of a single-celled leukocyte to his untrained eye there was nothing unusual about it he couldn't know what was strange when he had no idea of what was normal did you see those spherical green shapes grouped together leah asked before brian could answer she gasped i remember now her fatigue was forgotten in her excitement i sarah that was the name something like that it's a coccid a little scale insect it had those same shapes collected together within its individual cells what do they mean what is the connection with dis i don't know she said it's just that they look so similar and i never saw anything like this in a human cell before in the coccids the green particles grow into a kind of yeast that lives within the insect not a parasite but a real symbiote her eyes opened wide as she caught the significance of her own words a symbiote and this was the world where symbiosis and parasitism had become more advanced and complex than on any other planet leah's thoughts spun around this fact and chewed at the fringes of the logic brian could sense her concentration and absorption he did nothing to break the mood her hands were clenched her eyes staring unseeingly at the wall as her mind raced brian and ulv were quiet watching her waiting for her conclusions the pieces were falling into shape at last leah opened her clenched fist and smoothed them on her sodden shirt she blinked and turned to brian is there a toolbox here she asked her words were so unexpected that brian could not answer for a moment before he could say anything she spoke again not hand tools that would take too long could you find anything like a power saw that would be ideal she turned back to the microscope and he didn't try to question her ulv was still looking at the body of the magter and had understood nothing of what they had said 
Brian went out into the loading bay. There was nothing he could use on the ground floor, so he took the stairs to the floor above. A corridor here passed by a number of rooms. All the doors were locked, including the one with the hopeful sign, Tool Room, on it. He battered at the metal door with his shoulder without budging it. As he stepped back to look for another way in, he glanced at his watch. Two o'clock. In ten hours the bombs would fall on Dis. The need for haste tore at him, yet there could be no noise. Someone in the street might hear it. He quickly stripped off his shirt and wrapped it in a loose coil around the barrel of his gun, extending it in a loose tube in front of the barrel. Holding the rolled cloth in his left hand, he jammed the gun up tight against the door, the muzzle against the lock. The single shot was only a dull thud inaudible outside of the building. Pieces of broken mechanism jarred and rattled inside the lock, and the door swung open. When he came back, Leah was standing by the body. He held the small power saw with a rotary blade. Will this do? he asked. Runs on its own battery, almost fully charged, too. Perfect, she answered. You're both going to have to help me. She switched into the distant language. Ulv, would you find some place where you can watch the street without being seen? Signal me when it's empty. I'm afraid this saw is going to make a lot of noise. Ulv nodded and went out into the bay, where he climbed a heap of empty crates so he could pierce through the small window set high in the wall. He looked carefully in both directions, then waved to her to go ahead. Stand to one side and hold the cadaver's chin, Brian, she said. Hold it firmly so the head doesn't shake around when I cut. This is going to be a little gruesome. I'm sorry, but it'll be the fastest way to cut the bone. The saw bit into the skull. Once Ulv waved them into silence and shrank back himself into the shadows next to the window. They waited impatiently until he gave them the sign to continue again. Brian held steady while the saw cut a circle completely around the skull. Oh, finished, Leah said, and the saw dropped from her limp fingers to the floor. She massaged the life back into her hands before she finished the job. Carefully and delicately she removed the cap of bone from the magter's head, exposing his brain to the shaft of light from the window. You were right all the time, Brian, she said. There is your alien. End of chapter 15